So good to see you today. I'm glad that you're here at North Church to celebrate, and uh, it, it is a joy. We're week number three of this series we are calling Unstoppable. Uh, I do want to say this week you get to hear me, but last week you got to hear Shannon, my wife, and man, she delivered an incredible word, didn't she? Yeah. Amazing. So week number three of Unstoppable Prayer. Turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter number 3. 1 Samuel chapter number 3. Next week, just a matter of fact, a few days from now, today is Palm Sunday, and it is the triumphal entry of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, into uh, Jerusalem. But then this upcoming weekend, we're going to be celebrating uh, Easter, which speaks to his uh, death, burial, and then resurrection. And we're going to be celebrating his resurrection next week, as we should every single week. I uh, invite people to come to experience the goodness of God, uh, and to come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. I want you to pray with me. We're believing that between us here in Oklahoma City and Guthrie, we're going to see 3,000 people uh, come in these doors. 3,000 people begin to pray uh, for there and beyond. And then we're believing for 300 people to give their heart to Jesus Christ. Can you trust me with that? That's what we're believing for, 300 people to give their hearts to Jesus next weekend. And then the week after that, we're going to be celebrating our 15th birthday as a church. Come on, we've been 15 years since we started in our living room with three people. 15 years later, God's been very uh, good to us. He has blessed beyond what we can even ask or think. And so we're going to be celebrating that with eating after each and every experience and celebrating together. Uh, again, invite people to come be a part of that. 1 Samuel chapter number 3 and verse number 1. Let's look at the Word of God. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was, set with me, rare. There were not many visions. Where there is no vision, the people, what? Perish. One not Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, which also speaks to not just the physical, but the spiritual here, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. We'll revisit that verse later on. Then the Lord called out, Samuel, Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. He makes a statement there, my son, but it's not his physical son. He's saying that in relation to, to his role in the house of God here. Continue on. And the Lord said, Samuel, and Samuel, excuse me, I lost my verse. What verse am I on? Help me out. Seven. Verse 7. Okay, verse 7. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is, say it with me, listening. Some say God no longer speaks. Good denominations. Some speak, believe that. What they believe is this, is that the Word of God from Genesis to Revelations is God's method only that He speaks to the church today. Well-meaning, but yet I also believe that they are wrong. I believe God still speaks. I believe that God, just like Samuel, is trying to get our attention off the times, and maybe we're not listening. Or maybe our ears hasn't been trained to hear the voice of God. 
But God is still speaking today. Dallas Willard made this statement, which I thought is so powerful. He said, if God doesn't speak today, you'll see it on the screen, then the greatest disservice we could ever do to people is to tell them that they could have a personal relationship with God. You may want to write this down. Prayer, it's not in your notes. Prayer is not just talking to God, but prayer is also hearing God's voice. I know for my own life, I've been able to hear God's voice. Now, some of that has been trained over the years. I've learned to listen to the Spirit of God. I've learned the nudgings of the Spirit. Sometimes it's been stronger. Sometimes it's been very subtle. Sometimes I don't know, and I just by faith step out and kind of do what I feel like He's wanting me to do. It's a journey of faith. But I can look back in my life, and I can remember a time when I was a teenager. And as a teenager, trying to course out the direction of my life and lay it out there, I, I had the rug ripped up from underneath me. And I needed some answers from God. And I remember praying to God, saying, God, I need answers from you. And I just was desperate. And in my desperation, God spoke very clearly, clearly to me. He, he just said, Job 23 and verse 10. I don't know if that time I'd ever read the book of Job. But I went and found that verse. And that verse is a verse that still sticks with me today that God gave me. And I know he was speaking to me. I remember when I was dating Shannon. Again, I mean, I, I loved her. I wanted to spend my life with her. But I also wanted to hear God's voice clearly in this. I didn't want to take this lightly. God, speak to me. And I remember just crying out to him when I was driving down the road. And I was just like, God, Alma. And I'd asked this many, many times, but heard nothing back. But that moment, I heard a voice that just kind of spoke to me. and says, yes. And it was settled. Move forward. I remember when we started north. Actually, we hadn't even had our first experience yet. But I had left my position. I had no money. We, had, we, had, we were just saying, God, we need you. We were desperate for you. One night I was laying in my bed about midnight, going to sleep, tears rolling down my cheeks, and I was not wanting to show Shannon my desperation and my panic. But inside of me, I was struggling. I needed to hear God's voice. I woke up the next morning at 4 a.m. I remember looking at the clock, 4 a.m. I'm wide awake. I get out of bed. I go in the living room with my Bible and notepad just to do my morning Devo. And my morning Devo turned into God speaking to me. And for the next period of time, I was like I was seeing a vision. Not of an out-of-body experience. I still remember I could kind of look around. But I began to see myself standing on this pad where I looked like I'm going to build something. But I'm frustrated. I'm discouraged. I do not know what to do. And in my frustration, somebody from a distance begins to come and they're holding a hammer. And then I see somebody else with a piece of lumber. And then I see somebody else with some nails. And the next thing I know, I look around, and all around me, from every direction, hundreds of people are coming. And then I step out of the way, and I begin to see the structure being built. And then God directed me to a passage of Scripture in Psalms 127 and verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. It was God speaking to me. Now, if that was the only time that morning, that would have been enough in itself. But I left the house early that morning. And at 11 o'clock, I received a phone call on my mobile phone. And it was from a guy that I had met one time. I didn't remember the meeting, but I shook his hand at a minister's event one time. And he said, hey, I'm a pastor. He lives several hours away. And he said, I'm just calling you because God woke me up this morning at 4 o'clock. And I had a dream about you. When he said that, my ears are all listening. I didn't tell him what was going on with me. I just, I'm listening. He said, I had to get in touch with you. I did not have your number. So I looked up your number, called your home number, and your wife said, please call Rodney's mobile. So that's how I got your mobile number. And then he said, as I was having this dream, and I felt like I had to call you. And in this dream, you're standing on this pad like you're trying to build something. But you're so frustrated. And he said, but in the distance, somebody begins to come with a hammer. And then from another direction, somebody comes with a piece of lumber. And then there's nails. And then the next thing I see in my dream, people come from all around you by the hundreds. And then you step back, and that thing begins to be built. And they said, then God gave me a verse for you, Pastor Rodney. And I already knew it. I didn't, have to, I didn't tell him because I wanted to hear from him. But he said, Psalms 127 and verse number 1, unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in 
faith. God speaks. But why is it that we don't hear God's voice sometimes? There's many reasons. I mean, sin can be one of those reasons. You go to the book of Samuel chapter 3, it was sin that was the issue that the, that the, the word of God was rare. It was sin that there was a big part of that. But there's other reasons. Let me give you a few reasons. One is busyness. Oftentimes, busyness clogs the pot from being able to hear the voice of God. Our ears can't hear because of just, we're too busy. I, I heard somebody say it this morning. I said, hey, how are things going? And you know what they said to me? I'm so busy. Matter of fact, seven out of ten, maybe eight out of ten times when I ask somebody, how's life going? How's things going? They say, oh, I'm so, well, could it be that I'm so busy keeps us from hearing the voice of God? There's a story in the book of Luke chapter number 10. That story is a beautiful story of Jesus going to the house of Martha. And as he goes to the house of Martha, Martha owns the house, okay? And she is getting the meal prepared for Jesus and the disciples. And she's busy getting things together. And then Mary, her sister, goes and sits at the feet of Jesus just listening to him. Okay, now Martha owns the house. Mary is living rent-free. And so Martha is like very disturbed about this. And she gets worked up about it. And finally she gets enough guts to go talk to Jesus about it. And said, Jesus, I am busy getting food together for you and for all the disciples and taking care of all the details of this. And my sister is just sitting here listening to you. And I'm sure she's expecting Jesus to say, oh, Mary, jump on it, help. Make me some dinner. You know what Jesus says to back to says, Martha, Martha. You're distracted about many details and busy about all types of stuff. But it's Mary who's chosen the more important thing. <laughs> Here's a question for you. What is the more important thing? What is the more important thing? This week when you feel so busy, this week when things are going crazy, when this world is spinning and you're, on the, you're just spinning your wheels, what is the more important thing at that moment? And then, ask yourself a question, then what needs to be eliminated in my life so that I can hear God's voice? His nudgings, his promptings, what he's trying to speak to me, busyness. Also, competing voices. Competing voices are, one, are those things that just keep us from hearing the voice of God. I, I, I know many times whenever I step into a crowd of people and i got a lot of people around, and they're just like hundreds of people, and it's one of those loud environments, and I'm talking to one person, Come on, it's hard to focus on that one person because of all the competing what? Voices. All the voices around me. And especially, even when you want to talk to the person. But have you ever had a situation where you're talking to somebody and you're kind of, you, you, you know, you're into the conversation, but you hear somebody next to you talking and have a conversation and you'd rather be in that conversation because <laughs> anybody? And all of a sudden it's very hard. The competing voices are distracting you from what you really need to be doing and engaging with and focusing on at that time. Competing voices. Voices. I remember growing up on the farm and, and in the evening sitting on the tractor and we had an AM, FM radio and I would like to listen to Cardinal Baseball. And so after dark I would try to catch that Cardinal Baseball. And AM stations specifically, you know, you'd have overlap of stations as you begin to hear voices from other stations and, and like you're trying to fine tune it and you're trying, because all of the stations are competing voices for that one channel. How about you? I want you to write this down. To hear God's voice, you've got to tune out other voices. To hear God's voice, you've got to tune out other voices. So busyness, competing voices. How about this? How about an untrained ear? An untrained ear keeps us from hearing God's voice. An untrained ear. The Bible says that Samuel had not met it, had the word of the Lord revealed to him. He had not heard the, his ear was not trained. He was learning, he was growing, he was trying. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that, but just keep learning. Keep training your ear to the voice of the Holy Spirit in your life. You see, one of the greatest benefits of our salvation is the gift of being able to hear God's voice. And probably the greatest thing that would help every single one of us is learning how to get rid of the busyness and, the un and train our ear to hear the voice 
of the Lord. Hear the voice of the Lord. I was thinking about this this past week. I um, went to a baseball game of Carter Gutteridge, a young man in our church. And as I went to the baseball game, I watched him play. He's a very good ball player, high school baseball game. And at the end, when I'm leaving, I couldn't stay for the whole game. And as I'm leaving, I kind of just, as I get up, I'm walking out, I whistle at him. Real soft. He didn't answer. So I got a little louder. He didn't respond. So I go. Four times I whistled at him. And he never turned around. And he's over at the dugout. He never turned around. I was frustrated. Because I was trying to get Carter's attention. Because I wanted to give him just a thumbs up like you're doing great, awesome, before I leave. And here's why I was so frustrated about that. Because my son, when I used to whistle at him, he responded. The difference is, Carter's not my son. My son used to be out in center field in the middle of a game. I'd go, and he'd immediately look up in the stands at me. He could be on the football field in the huddle with the band playing, come on, and thousands of people, and I can go, and he'd look up at the stands, and I'd give the thumbs up. Why? Because his ear had been trained to hear his father's whistle. Carter's ear had not been trained to hear my whistle. But Gavin's ear had been trained. You see, my question for you, is your ear trained to hear your father's whistle? Is your ear trained to hear his nudging? Is your ear trained to hear his whispers? Is your ear trained to hear those moments when he's trying to get your attention? And he's saying, I got something for you. And you know what? God wants you to have a trained ear. I need help. I need all of us to stand to your feet. Come on, stand. Just stand to your feet. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to play something, all right? And as we play uh, this noise, you can be seated when you hear the noise. Now, let me just say this. There are going to be a few people that may be seated, and you may be standing next to somebody, or you may see somebody down the row who is being seated. Do not be tempted to sit just because they sat, okay? Because you would be lying. And there's a story in the book of Acts where someone died in the house of God because they lied. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm preaching right now. Just giving you the word of God. So, come on, we don't want to have to carry you out and just keep this service going, all right? We want to. So we're going to play this sound and do not be seated unless you clearly, not just, oh, I think. No, you clearly hear this noise. Okay, ready? Let's go. Now, there's a few people that are like, oh, I think I might be seated. No, no, no. Remain standing. Now, look around. Look around. The reason why all of you are still standing is because you are old. <laughs> you're old. Look at the person next to you and say, you're old. You're old. You can, old. You, you can be seated. You can be seated. <laughs> Come on. What you, what you just heard or what you did not hurt here, either way, was 17.4 kilohertz of sound. It's a very high frequency that how it happens, as we get older, our ears tend to not be able to hear frequencies that we once heard. Now, it can happen at different times. Sad for me, I have not heard it once, Okay. <laughs> Two years ago, I could hear it. Two years ago, I could hear that sound, and now I can't hear it. It's a sad day for me. I, I was boasting like a couple of years ago that I could hear it, and now I can't hear it. But typically, in your 20s, most people begin to lose that frequency sound, and you can't hear it anymore. Just because you don't hear the voice of God does not mean God's not speaking. God's speaking to people. God wants to speak to you. So I want to talk to you a little bit about how to hear the voice of God. Okay, God speaks. God speaks to us. Look at this verse again. Verse number three. Notice what he says. It says the lamp of God had not yet gone out. Matter of fact, it's saying it's going out but had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Did you get that? 
three phrases I want you to get out of this. The lamp of God, the ark of God, the house of God. The lamp of God, write them down. The ark of God, the house of God. So God speaks. Number one is this. First off, God speaks as we listen to his promises. God speaks as we listen to his promises. This is so key to note. Did you note in verse number one it says that the word of God was rare in those days? There were not many visions. The word of God was going out. Think about that for just a moment. Think about the lamp of God. In the book of Psalms it says the lamp of God is what? The word of God is a lamp unto my and a light unto my the Word of God is what we need. And the Word of God was what they weren't having. And so we got to tune our ear to the Word of God. That means we need to be listening to the Word of God. When you read the Word in the morning, have you ever read God's Word and you really weren't listening to God's Word? And then have you ever had those moments where you tune your ear and you can open up God's Word and it begins to speak volumes to you? Ask God to sharpen your ear to what He's wanting to speak through His written Word. Ask God what he's speaking to you when you get into your small group and your north group. Because you see, God wants to use other people to speak to you. He wants to use other young people to speak to you. He wants to use other uh, married couples to speak to you. He wants to speak to you here when you come each week. When you come in here each and every week, open your ears to what the Spirit of the Lord is saying and say, God, may I hear your promises. The promises are the written word of God that are yes and amen for us today. The Word of God is alive and it's sharper than a two-edged sword speaking to us today. The Word of God. And the Word of God is still trying to speak to you and trying to speak to me. I got up at 5 a.m. And at 5 a.m. I opened God's Word to do Devo. I don't always do Devo on Sunday morning because I'm trying to get my thoughts for the message. But God began to speak to me. And God gave me a burden for you guys today. That was a little heavier than normal. And I just felt it heavy. Because I felt like today that there was going to be people that need to hear the voice of the Lord. You're desperate. And you need to hear God's voice today. I can't make that happen for you. But I can't give you God's word. And I can't pray. My heart burned inside because some of it maybe it's for direction in your marriage. Some of it may be for your kids. Some of it may be a kid that in relationships and where to go to college and what to do. And man, you need to hear God. And God is wanting to reveal to you his voice and speak to you. Secondly is this. We hear God's voice as we cultivate his presence. As we cultivate his presence. He spoke about the lamp of God and then the ark of God. Do you know that the ark of God is the presence of God? That's what it represented in the Old Testament. And wherever the presence of God went, the ark of God was there. The ark of God just correlated with the presence of God. And here is Samuel in there with the ark of God, the presence of God. I was thinking about this week as I spoke to the 252 interns, our group of students that are teenagers that serve in our church so faithfully. And so they're interns for this semester. So every semester we have interns. And so these 252 students, I'm speaking to them. And I asked, what is the greatest struggle, that, one of the great struggles that your generation deals with? And, you know, one of them spoke up and kind of all of them nodded their head. Our phones. We're addicted to our phones. We're addicted to our phones. Because see what happens, those phones, you know, they release a dopamine. Because we, not the phone releases a dopamine. Our relationship with the phone releases a dopamine, which we become connected to that. And what happens is that have you ever had that moment where you can't find your phone and you feel like throwing up? You feel like you're disconnected from whatever and like, oh, no, what's going on with my life? It's because we've developed an addiction to the presence of the phone that is in our life, okay? We've developed that over time. And I told the teenagers, hey, it's not just you guys, it's all of us. It's quickly captured our culture, and we all have a struggle with our mobile devices of being addicted to them. I, I took our staff last week, last week on a road trip. We went down to our hometown of Spiro and... and I, Took them to have my mom's cooking 
And so they ate my mom's cooking, which was awesome. Then we went to Shad's Catfish and their hush puppies and the beans and all the stuff, and it was incredible. But in the middle there, we went to my uncle's church who started the church 12 years ago in a town of 2,000. Now they have a sanctuary that seats like 700 people, and great things have happened, and God is doing a mighty thing. There's a revival going on in that town. And I listened to him talk, and he talked to our staff, and he said, since I was five years old, I've been addicted to the presence of God. He said, I've just wanted the presence of God more than anything else in my life. And come on, I'll tell you what, what we got to have if we're going to hear the voice of God is the presence of God. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 2, it's, look at this, what it says about, it says that Samuel grew up in the, set with me, presence of the Lord. Samuel grew up, set with me again, in the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord is what we need. The presence of the Lord is what we must have. The presence of the Lord is so important. Come on, it is so amazing to look at Eli. Eli is not the father of Samuel. Samuel is the son of Hannah. And Hannah was a lady who had cried out for a child and she was barren. She couldn't have a kid. And one day she's at the temple of God, the house of God, crying out to God. And God gives her her answer. And she, the Bible says, was like she was drunk. And Eli looks at her and says, you're drunk with wine, aren't you? Here's the sad part about Eli. Somewhere along the way, he lost identity with the presence of God. He stopped identifying the presence of God. He had been around the presence of God. And here's the warning. You can come to this church week after week and be around the presence of God and never see and understand and acknowledge the presence of God. That comes with a heart that's tender and pliable and says, God, I just got to be in your presence. And she says, oh, no, I'm not drunk with wine. I've just been in the presence of the Lord. God gave her a child. She gave the child back to the house of God. Now Samuel's in the house of God, growing up in the house of God, around the presence of God. And it's in the presence of God that we hear the voice of God. Don't take that for granted. I was thinking about my daughter, Annabeth. A few weeks back, she brought uh, some of her soccer friends to the women's conference. One of the young girls from Czechoslovakia had never been in an environment like this in her life. And I watched her on the front row as I sat there and she sat over here. I watched her as from the very first words, she kind of looked in awe like, wow, what is this? She kind of looked around at people and she'd look up at the screen, she'd look around at people. And after a while of singing the in the praises and the presence of God, she began to weep. And for the next four songs, and while the speaker was speaking, she cried the whole time. They were supposed to go home on Saturday. That was a Friday night. They were going to go home on Saturday. And she was going to go back to Tulsa. And they said, could we stay for Sunday? I said, oh, yeah, you can stay for Sunday. And I watched her on Sunday as she stood over there. And she just cried. She just stood holding her, folding her hands, looking at the screen, just bawling like a baby. Why? Because of the presence of God. You see, we can take so for granted the presence of God that we begin to miss the presence of God. Lastly is this. So we hear God's voice as we are planted in His church. As we are planted in His church. Said the lamp of God, the ark of God, but then the house of God. In that translation, it said the house of the Lord, but it's the house of God. The house of God. I've got somebody to help me out with my props today. Come on, bring them on out. It's Palm Sunday. But I've got to be honest with you, on Thursday when I was bringing this to the church, I had this in the back of my truck, and I was transporting it here, and it was all kind of blowing in the wind, and... Um, I saw a highway patrolman jump in right behind me, turn on his lights, and begin to come up behind me real quick. And I'm like, oh, no, he thinks I have marijuana back in the room. <laughs> Man. <laughs> Planted in the house of God. No, so... Samuel was not Eli's son. 
But Eli had two sons, Ophna and Phineas. And man, they were doing some bad things. Oh, they were still serving in the house of the Lord. Still doing bad things. You see, because Eli's sons, they were raised around God's house, but they were never really planted in God's house. And there's a big difference. You can be around the things of God. miss out you see I could have seeds here I could take those seeds and throw them on the ground boom 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 we can come back next week next year ten years from now (laughs) those seeds are still gonna be there they're never gonna amount to anything their potential is never gonna be reached because it really wasn't planted it has to be planted I think we understand that and there's people like that that just never were planted and then there's people that were planted But somewhere they got disconnected. And they got disconnected. And you see, this looks good still, doesn't it? But it's just a matter of time. For the real effects of it not being planted is going to be revealed. Matter of fact, this has been since Thursday. And I can already tell it's starting to soften up. It's not what it should be. But it's still going to look good. It's still going to look green for a while. But it's really not going to stand the test of time. And how many people do I know that way that aren't really rooted, they aren't really planted? Now, they may even show up to church, but they're not rooted. They're not planted in the house of God. And we're not rooted, you're not planted in the house of God. It's going to be a matter of time where the testings and the trials and the struggles, or maybe it's not you. Maybe it's your kids don't go to church. Maybe your kids fall out later on, and they choose to never be faithful. Maybe it was because you were never really rooted and planted in the house of God. But then there's this, it's rooted, it's planted. You know, if I were to take it actually and plant it in the ground, you know what's going to happen? Come on, bring it on. The winds can come, and it can be literally almost knocked all the way over on its side. And it can be laying on its side as the winds are just raging around it. But when the winds die out, it's going to pop back up. The sun can beat down on it through the heat of the summer, but yet its roots are going down and finding moisture and finding a source of life. And it's the same way with you who are planted in the house of God. Because when you're planted in the house of God, you're going to have seasons of drought. You're going to have seasons of storms. You're going to have seasons that are going to be very tough. But I'm telling you, you'll be able to hear the voice of God because you'll be planted in the house of God. And God speaks through the people of God. And God speaks through His promises. And God speaks through His presence that shows up in the house of God. And we all got to have the house of God and be planted if we are going to hear the voice of God.